For us, life unfolds on human scales. Miles. Feet. Inches. But beneath the surface of things is another realm, a billion times smaller than we are. A dimension that holds the secrets to understanding our world. What makes steel strong? Why ice cream is delicious? What makes life possible? Secrets that help us create what we imagine. The human creativity of chemistry, there's just nothing more beautiful than that. This is the realm of chemistry, and these are its greatest discoveries. Ancient Greek philosophers believed there were just four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, and that air was the underlying element, a single substance responsible for the makeup of everything in the world. Centuries later, Leonardo da Vinci was among the first to suggest that instead of being an element, air might consist of two different gases. It remained a mystery until our first great discovery. England, the latter part of the 18th century. Clergyman and sometimes scientist Joseph Priestley conducted a series of experiments searching for new airs, what today we call gases. So the thing about the 18th century... To find out more about what Priestley was up to, I paid a visit to Arnold Thackeray, president and historian at the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Doing this, and Priestley wrote and wrote and wrote on every subject that you've ever thought of. He wrote about history, he wrote about religion, he wrote about politics, he wrote, science. He wrote about science endlessly. And Priestley was the man who knew everything. He would tell you the practice of it, the history of it, the theory of it, and he was quite literally the man who knew everything. But along with everything else, Priestley did this famous experiment, right? That's exactly correct. And there are two things that go into that experiment. The one is mercury, this strange substance that's simultaneously a liquid and metal. And that's just crazy. I mean, whoever heard <laughs> of crazy. a liquid metal? And so it was really puzzling what is this thing, and people were fascinated by it, and so they wanted to explore it. And, of course, the other thing that went into it was the technology to deal with gases. And here, in Priestley's experiments and observations on different kinds of air, we have the technology of collecting gases over liquids. In tubes that you could see through. Exactly. So you can see the gas, you can see what's happening to the gas, and now you really are in business. What Priestley does is he takes a burning glass uh, to give lens. him heat, a lens. He focuses it on this orange powder, the mercuric calx. He heats it. It changes into this metal mercury, and a gas comes off. But Priestley doesn't really realize what it is that he's found. The answer would emerge in 1774, after Priestley paid a visit to Paris and shared the story of his discovery with another scientist, Antoine Lavoisier. Paris is a marvelous place for Priestley to visit because Antoine Lavoisier is in Paris, talk of the town, doing the work that will end up as his elementary text on chemistry. Mm -hmm. And Lavoisier, 
who is also mucking about with gases, hears what Priestley's done, is fascinated by the report of this new air, decides he'll repeat the experiment. He has lots of apparatus, better apparatus. He's a meticulous experimenter. And among other things, he weighs things. Lavoisier, by weighing, says something is being emitted. He calls the thing emitted oxygen. He rewrites the whole script of chemistry, and he creates a list of elements that we still use today. Oxygen, hydrogen, sulfur. You can correctly say that Priestley discovered oxygen, but Lavoisier invented it. So, with Priestley's experimental work on gases, with the discovery of oxygen, with Lavoisier's articulation of a system of language, we have the whole conceptual scheme in which 19th century academic work is built, 20th century industrial innovation. We have pharmaceuticals, we have biotechnology, we plastics. have cell phones, we have plastics, that's exactly right. And all these things begin with the discovery of oxygen. That's where it starts. That's a lot to breathe in. In the early 19th century, a British school teacher named John Dalton was hard at work, pursuing his fascination with chemistry, which would lead to our next great discovery. Dalton's experiments showed that the known elements such as oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon combined in definite and constant proportions. From his calculations, he hypothesized that the elements must be made up of smaller, invisible pieces of matter with relative and distinctive weights. He called these pieces of matter atoms. So what did Dalton discover? Dalton's great discovery was what he called the relative weights of ultimate particles. Ultimate particles. That's what he called it. It's a lovely phrase. Later on, when he went public, it becomes atomic weights. And we know it as atomic weights, but it was ultimate particles. So he used the word atoms. He used the word atoms. The, the idea of an atom, of course, goes back to Democritus. The problem is, it's an idea. Is it any use? And Dalton was the man who made the idea useful. That was his great contribution. From his work, Dalton developed what came to be known as his atomic theory, a revolutionary new system that defined the relationship between atoms and the elements. And it's an enormously simple system. And Dalton thinks very simply, very visually. Here are the elements. Here are the weight of the elements. Here are the complex molecules. And it's a wonderfully effective system. It connects the thing that chemists can do, weigh things in balances with the things that you can't see, the ultimate world of atoms. That's genius. How important was Dalton's discovery? His atomic theory helped generations of scientists further unravel the mysteries of the atomic and molecular world, including our next great discovery. In the early 1800s, French chemist Joseph Gay-Lussac was conducting a series of experiments designed to study Dalton's atomic theory when he observed something odd. When he combined equal volumes of different gases and measured their reactions, the gases often produced twice the volume than he expected. How was this possible? The answer was provided in 1811 by Amadeo Avogadro, a physics professor at the University of Turin in Italy. While studying the results of Gay-Lussac's research, Avogadro had an insight. At the time, it was believed that gases were made of single atoms. Avogadro realized this assumption was wrong. The gases were made of multiple atoms, what came to be known as molecules. The realization that atoms could be rearranged to form molecules was the breakthrough that enabled scientists to move out of the chemistry dark ages and begin systematically creating new compounds. Our next great discovery occurred in the 19th century when many chemists believed that organic substances from organisms or living things 
were somehow different from inorganic substances, from non-living things. But that was about to change. In 1828, Friedrich Wohler was working in his lab when something caught his eye. Wohler had placed two inorganic chemicals in a beaker, potassium cyanate and ammonium sulfate. Now when he looked at the beaker, it contained a gram's worth of small, white, needle-shaped crystals. What made this remarkable was that Wohler thought he'd seen these exact same crystals once before, but with an important difference. Those crystals had been organic. He had crystallized them while studying the chemistry of various substances found in urine. To make sure he wasn't mistaken, Wohler analyzed the new crystals. There was no mistake. These crystals were the same as those he had isolated before. He had made urea, which was something that had come out of a living thing. He had made it out of inorganic substances. Later, he said in a personal letter, not in the paper he wrote about it, that I have made urea without a kidney. And he knew what he had done. Meet Roald Hoffman, winner of the 1981 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for developing a theory to explain organic chemical reactions. So why is this discovery of artificially making urea, why is that a great discovery? You know, there comes a time when you need a discovery and it's sometimes a single one, to cross a border, to break down a wall. This is what this discovery was. Wow. It's not that it was so important in and of itself, but at the time that it came, the simple making of urea out of two inorganic chemicals, when it came, it caught people's attention. The whole story of the discovery is about the the underlying basis, the building blocks of all matter, organic and inorganic, being the same, atoms. If these Lego bricks had existed in the early part of the 19th century, chemists could have used them to help illustrate something they were seeing in their experiments, a phenomenon that led to our next great discovery. The atoms of particular elements, such as sodium and chlorine, seem to combine with each other according to fixed ratios. It was this combining power of atoms that inspired German chemist Auguste Kekulé to develop a system for visualizing the chemical structure of various molecules. Kekulé represented the atoms by their symbols, then added marks to indicate how they bonded with each other, like links in a chain. It was a simple yet elegant formula. Chemists now had a device for clearly illustrating the chemical structures of the molecules they were studying. There was just one problem. Benzene was the only known chemical that would not fit Kekulé's formula. Benzene's chain of carbon and hydrogen atoms required more combining power than the formula would allow. And all these organic chemistry professors are puzzling about it and offering different explanations. And one of them, August Kekulé, sitting by the fire one evening, falls asleep and starts to dream about a snake. And if you think about a snake, what Kekulé dreams of is the snake catches its own tail. And if you think about this, maybe the thing is a ring. And that gives you an answer to the puzzle. The six carbon atoms of the benzene molecule weren't linked in a chain. Like the snake, they formed a ring, each with a hydrogen atom attached, with alternating single and double bonds. Within a short time, Kekulé's insight was confirmed, and its effect was revolutionary. Chemists knew that all organic substances contained one or more carbon atoms in their molecules. With Kekulé's discovery, they now had the underlying formula to explain how carbon combined with other molecules to form a world of chemical compounds. The modern era of organic chemistry was born. Now, with this thing being so simple, that is to say, the snake bites its tail, why is this considered a great discovery? Here is a recipe 
for new drugs, new medicines, new understanding. If you go back in time, in Dalton's day, a couple of hundred compounds. Soon it's a couple of thousand. Soon it's 10,000. Astonishing. Soon it's 100,000. Last year, 15 million new compounds were registered, all built on this simple template. This is a work of genius. In 1869, a Russian chemistry professor named Dmitry Mendeleev was writing a textbook for his students when he began to wonder how he could best explain to them the 63 elements that were known at the time. To help formulate his thoughts, he constructed a card for each element. On each card, he wrote the name of the element, its atomic weight, its typical properties, and its similarities to other elements. He then laid the cards out like a game of solitaire and began arranging them over and over, searching for patterns. Then came the moment of discovery. Before him was something extraordinary. The elements fell into seven vertical groupings. Each periodic grouping had members that resembled one another, both chemically and physically. Mendeleev had discovered the periodic table of the elements, a map showing how all the elements related to one another. A map so precise that Mendeleev believed he could also use it to predict the existence and properties of three elements no one had yet discovered. One would be like boron, he said, one like aluminum, and one like silicon. Eventually, the elements were discovered and Mendeleev was proven right. There was actually a little bit of controversy because a German chemist named Lothar Meyer had come up with roughly the same idea, but Meyer didn't quite have as much courage. So that's actually an interesting thing. Here is this German who comes up with the same idea of periodicity, of which there were hints already before, but he doesn't make the predictions that Mendeleev does. So here we see the power of a risky prediction in having people accept a theory. There is nothing more powerful than making a prediction that's not obvious. And, and then have it come true. And have it come true. Yeah. If you look in his notebooks, I think you see something much more interesting than the playing cards. What you see is this. It's just like you and me, if we were out to order anything in the world, first stalling for time, we'd make a list. So he makes a list of the elements. He has at the bottom of the page the elements listed in order of their weight, of their atomic mass. Hydrogen, helium wasn't around, lithium, beryllium, boron. Then he groups them together on the page. He writes a trial table. And as he fits the element in a table, just like you and I would, he crosses them out from his list. He said, I've fitted this in. Underneath, he writes in German, left over, über. Uh, that is, these are things that don't fit in. Three elements don't fit in the first time he gets them in the table. The whole table is full of crossings out. I just love it. What you see here, and what are we going to do in the computer age when those things are not there? Uh, what we see here is a human being at work trying, desperately trying, to understand this universe. We see a draft of it. The periodic table is our icon. I mean, that it's, it's what we associate with chemistry. You go into any chemistry room, you see it. Why is the periodic table of elements significant? It forever changed the way that everyone would learn and understand the elements. The periodic table of elements is to chemistry as notes of music are to a Beethoven sonata. In honor of Mendeleev, his name is now literally attached to the periodic table. The element 101 was named after him. It's called Mendelevium. 
it's not only chemists who, who like the periodic table. I hear you carry one around. I do carry one, yes, sir. Show me. You never know. And I seem to use it a lot. Let's see. It's a small one. So I'm going to give you a test. Uh, what is under nitrogen in the periodic table? Nitrogen is seven. Yes. I have to think a second. It's under nitrogen. No, you're wrong. Yeah, okay. That's Close. Why I carry you're the thing. one off. It's phosphorus. Oh, phosphorus. It? Phosphorus 15. is right. And is phosphorus is 15. Yeah, you have to add eight at that point. I uh, see. That's why I carry it. I can't remember. So it's seven plus eight, 15 phosphorus. Okay. There's, there's a pattern there. Ever wondered what lies far and beyond? Endeavor to find an answer to mysteries of the scientific world. Based on the highly acclaimed journal, this informative series attempts to examine in depth the scientific breakthroughs and the ongoing projects in the scientific arena. At the turn of the 19th century, electricity was all the rage. People were busy making batteries and connecting them to just about anything to see the reaction. Electricity was like a new kind of fire. One of the great battery junkies of the day was Humphrey Davy, a self-taught English chemist. In 1807, Davy was performing a battery experiment in his lab. He melted some potash, a mineral found in the ground that also forms in the ashes of wood. Chemists had speculated that potash was a compound of several elements, but had not been able to prove it. Davy wanted to see if electricity might provide the answer. He ran some wires from one of his biggest batteries to the melted potash. Pure potassium began to emerge. Davy had discovered the power of electricity to react with chemicals and transform them. Eventually, electrochemistry led to the rise of the aluminum industry, the production of semiconductors, solar panels, LED displays, even rechargeable lithium batteries. In the 1850s, Robert Bunsen and his research collaborator Gustav Kirchhoff conducted a series of experiments to determine why substances emitted specific colors when placed in a flame. The color they determined indicates what elements are present in the substance. For example, if sodium is placed in a flame, they observe shades of yellow. Copper, shades of green. Strontium, shades of red. That was a good one. While watching the experiments, Kirchhoff was reminded of how a prism spreads light into a rainbow of colors. So, using a prism and the pieces of a small telescope, Bunsen and Kirchhoff built the first spectroscope, an analytical device they'd hoped would help them see the spectra coming from heated substances, and it worked. As an element was put into the flame of a Bunsen burner, the light from the heated substance passed through the prism of the spectroscope, where it then spread into a ribbon-like spectrum of colors, riddled with dark lines. The combinations of bright colors and dark lines were like barcodes indicating what atoms were present. When burned, each element produced a completely unique spectrum. Using their spectroscope, Bunsen and Kirchhoff were able to discover two new elements, cesium and rubidium. One day, Bunsen and Kirchhoff decided to test their invention with sunlight. It produced a spectrum that featured two lines that were identical to those in the spectrum produced by sodium. Bunsen and Kirchhoff had discovered the presence of sodium in the sun, 93 million miles away. 
Suddenly, scientists had a tool to help them study the chemistry of the heavens. Liftoff. We have liftoff. Today, the legacy of this great discovery lives on in the exploration of space. A form of spectroscopy is being used to study the atmospheres of planets, to search for signs of water, signs of life. Our next great discovery is the story of Joseph Thompson and the electron. So here we are. So everything that we can see is made of chemicals. That's right. What's the future? And they're all bonded through electron interactions. Thank goodness. In the future. To find out about it, I paid a visit to Harvard University. Dudley Hirschbach is a professor here and winner of the 1986 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his research into the dynamics of chemical elementary processes. So, uh, Thompson didn't discover the electron. Well, it's of course said that way, but he didn't discover in the sense that he said, Eureka, I've got this thing, here it is. He did an experiment that allowed him to measure the ratio of the charge, the electric charge, the mass. And then later he was able to get a rough measurement of the charge and therefore show that the mass was very, very small. It was about one two thousandths of the mass of the lightest known atom, hydrogen atom. So it showed that he could extract in the experiment a very small piece of an atom. Well, that was a tremendous shock. People didn't know that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Electrical piece of an atom. It was a very small and, and, part of the atom. And, and it's so, it's such an important... At the time of his discovery, Thompson was a professor at England's University of Cambridge. He was using a device called a Crookes tube in his experiments. I happen to have here a little apparatus that's uh, akin to the one that J.J. Thompson used in 1897. It's called a cathode ray tube, just an evacuated little glass cylinder with some electrodes. And we can hook this up and uh, show the key points of his experiment. A replica of the first CRT. Yeah. It's the first cathode ray tube. It's ancestor of the television tube, as a matter of fact. You do the last one, and we should get a stream of cathode rays or electrons going there, and it'll show up. A few of them bang into this phosphor-coated piece of cardboard there. Here, I'll give you a magnetic field you can use to deflect the electrons. When Thompson exposed the stream of cathode rays to a magnet, the stream would bend. Since magnets can only affect matter, this meant the stream of rays was composed of some kind of electrically charged substance called radiant matter. After many hours of observing and measuring, Thompson realized he'd found the first subatomic particles. The ray was a stream of electrons. It was a revolutionary discovery. Some years later, a student of Thompson, Ernest Rutherford, was able to show that the positive charge in atoms, which was, of course had to be there to balance the negative charges of these little electrons that were scooting around, was localized in a tiny, tiny nucleus. Uh, 100,000 times smaller than the size of the atom. And so almost all the mass was, of course, in that nucleus as well, because electrons are so light. And that's still the model we have today, right? That's the basic model for atoms, and of course the key to understanding everything involving atoms. Like chemistry. Like chemistry in particular, that's right. Scientists were just beginning to discover the anatomy of the atom. Now they wanted to understand its behavior, specifically the mechanism that enabled the atoms of certain elements to combine with the atoms of other elements to form new substances. In the early 1900s, American chemist Gilbert Lewis developed a model of the atom that provided an answer. It is he who explained that electrons and atoms, and chemistry is about electrons, it's not about nuclei, that the electrons and atoms went in shells around the nucleus. 
In Lewis's model of the atom, each shell allows only a maximum number of electrons. Lewis theorized that two chemical elements might combine to form a compound when they give up or accept electrons from their outer shells. For example, on their own, sodium and chlorine are hazardous. But when a single sodium atom gives up the electron from its outer shell, and a single chlorine atom's outer shell accepts it, this exchange allows the two to bond and form the compound sodium chloride, table salt. Gilbert Lewis's theory was an extraordinary breakthrough. It enabled scientists to begin making chemical compounds, millions of them, compounds that have shaped the face of modern life. Our next great discovery started in the 1890s with the discovery of an unknown radiation called X-rays. It caused a sensation, and scientists immediately began looking for other substances that emitted strange, perhaps valuable forms of radiation. Over the next several decades, a number of scientists investigated the phenomena and together ended up shedding light on one of the great scientific sleuthing episodes of modern science. French physicist Henri Becquerel made the first significant breakthrough. In 1896, he conducted a series of experiments to see if various minerals emitted radiation. One of the minerals he happened to test was uranium. Becquerel's technique was to place different objects on top of an unexposed photographic plate, still wrapped in protective black paper. He would sprinkle the uranium onto another piece of black paper, then enclose the object between the uranium and the photographic plate. Later, Becquerel would develop the plate, and without fail, a ghostly photographic outline of the object would appear. From these experiments, Becquerel was able to prove conclusively that he had found a source for the mysterious radioactive rays that everyone was looking for. That source was uranium. From Becquerel, the investigation of radioactivity was taken up by Marie Curie. Curie and her husband Pierre undertook the job of isolating whatever elements were responsible for the radioactivity in uranium ore. For two years, the Curies boiled, sifted, filtered, and processed several tons of uranium ore. Finally, they succeeded in isolating two new elements contained in the ore, which they called polonium and radium. Marie Curie concluded that radium was a million times more radioactive than uranium. More importantly, she determined that the mysterious form of energy which enabled radioactivity to penetrate other materials was not the result of a chemical process, but seemed to be atomic in nature. Unfortunately, her discoveries came at great cost. The dangers of being exposed to radioactivity were still unknown at the time, and in 1934, Marie Curie died of leukemia, believed to have been caused by radiation poisoning. Even the notebooks that she used to record her observations are still considered too radioactive to handle. It was the atomic nature of radioactivity that eventually attracted the interest of physicist Ernest Rutherford, whom we already met in the discovery of the electron. Rutherford found that radioactive material goes through a natural process of decay. As it moves through the process, the radioactivity spontaneously emits unstable and highly charged energy particles with the power to penetrate matter. Rutherford called them alpha and beta particles and gamma rays. Since those discoveries, we've learned a lot about radioactivity, the dangers as well as the benefits. Radioactivity has given us medical imaging, a treatment for tumors, a method for calculating the age of the Earth, and a power source for our spacecraft to explore the solar system. 
Even some smoke detectors contain a small amount of radioactive material called americium, which helps create a steady electrical current. When smoke particles disrupt that current, it triggers the alarm. Centuries ago, alchemists set their sights high. They sought infinite wealth and immortality through miraculous transformations of matter. They came up with useful tools and glassware, but not much else. Chemists, on the other hand, set their sights a bit lower and ended up changing the look and feel of the material world, as did our next great discovery. In the 1860s, John Hyatt, a printer and amateur chemist in Albany, New York, made news when he discovered a way to exploit the long stringy molecules of cellulose found naturally in plants and created the first plastic. 50 years later, Belgium-born chemist Leo Baekeland took the next step in the discovery process. One of the great pioneers was Leo Baekeland, who made a polymer called Bakelite. The usual thing, a chance favoring the prepared mind. He was mixing things, but he, he knew how to explore them. He saw the interesting properties of this. From two chemicals derived from coal, Bakelin discovered the world's first fully synthetic plastic. And the landscape of the 20th century was forever changed. What exactly is a plastic? Plastics are polymers. So what are polymers? Polymers are long chain molecules, not individual molecules that are then clumped up into any, a solid of some sort. They're really molecules that extend out very far. Chains of carbon atoms, sometimes with some other elements in them. So what are the advantages? Well, it's moldable. You can pour it in some liquid form into some mold. Strength, well, it's okay. that's not bad. You can make bulletproof vests from plastics. And we've certainly seen that in terms of fibers, they can mimic or even surpass the properties of natural fibers. No fisherman in the world is going to go back to having nets out of cotton, you can bet. They're, those nets are going to be out of nylon. Plastics are incredible. We have in plastics materials that can be very strong, flexible. They can be fibers. They have replaced building materials at various stages. What's interesting is that they are also natural. I mean, they're in us uh, through proteins and nucleic acids. and as a product of cultural evolution, we've made them. I mean, polyacetylene here was not on Earth before. We've made them with very careful designed properties. It's an extension of chemistry to things which are not just one molecule, but which are a chain and in three dimensions a lattice work. I think it's a way that we have of trying to exercise control over our environment. So would you say the discovery of plastics is a great discovery? We have science making polymers, making nylon, making rayon, which has a natural starting point but is modified into a polymer, making plexiglass or polyethylene. Those are the structural materials of our civilization. I think polymers are in that sense, an example of the human creativity of chemistry, there's just nothing more beautiful than them. This single gram of black powder costs $500, about 30 times the price of gold. Remarkably, it's a special very, kind of uh, soot made of molecules called carbon nanotubes. Each nanotube is about one billionth of a meter in diameter, thinner than a strand of DNA, yet filled with a world of promise that has a lot of people excited, including a scientist who helped discover them. Richard Smalley is a professor of chemistry at Rice University in Houston, Texas. 
1985, he and fellow chemists Robert Curl and Harold Croto were studying chemical conditions in outer space. Using sophisticated laser and spectroscopic equipment, they were searching for evidence that might help reveal the chemical nature of interstellar matter. Instead, they found something else, for which they would share the 1996 Nobel Prize for Chemistry. What exactly did you discover? Well, in 1985, over a period of a week, we discovered that there was one special cluster of carbon atoms that had precisely 60 atoms that was magic, it was specially stable compared to any other cluster. And we wondered why. In fact, 60 turns out to be a very special number. It is the maximum number of objects you can arrange around the surface of a sphere such that every one is identical to every other one by a simple rotation. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that would have been any number, but no, it's 60. Smalley, Croto, and Curl named the new molecules buckyballs after Buckminster Fuller, the architect who designed the geodesic dome. What they'd really discovered was a whole new class of large, all-carbon molecules, which came to be called fullerenes. A molecule is not just when some atoms are stuck together by good bonds. It's a, there's another property of a molecule, and that is when you put the last atom, it kind of clicks and it's, it's done. It's stable. And you offer it another atom and says, no, thanks, I'm, I'm happy the way I am. Well, that's what C60 was. We were offering it other carbon atoms in the apparatus we built, and it said, no, I'm going to stay with 60. So here's a molecule. At least it was a molecule in my mind's eye that seemed to explain the results, which has the most symmetry of any molecule ever discovered. It's a big thing. This is about a nanometer in diameter, about 10 angstroms here, a nanometer, a billionth of a meter. In 1991, the significance of fullerenes gained even more momentum when Sumio Ijima, a scientist at the NEC Corporation, discovered yet another category of the cage-like wonders. But these fullerenes were slightly different. They were made of hollow molecules of pure carbon that formed a seamless hollow tube called carbon nanotubes, or in honor of Smalley's discovery, bucky tubes. There's bucky balls, right? All right. And then there's bucky tubes. Yeah, I've got a, <laughs> these things get awfully big now. A tube of the diameter of this ball is this big. And this is, a, this is a fullerene, same sort of structure. You know, here are the pentagons here, and there's the hexagons. There's six pentagons here, six pentagons there, 12 total. And in between, all these hexagons. And now this thing is just a sort of a bucky capsule, but you can imagine this thing being very long. And in fact, these things have made, been made millions of times longer than their diameter now. Um, and these objects have incredible properties. Like what? Well, for one thing, if you, instead of holding this plastic object, which I can easily rip apart, if you held a bucky tube in your hands and you had to pull it, you'd find it is the stiffest object in the universe. Stiffer than steel. Stiffer than steel. Stiffer than diamond. Stiffer than diamond. But you're a big guy, you can pull it. You'd find that you can stretch it out quite a bit before it breaks. And we expect we'll find that it's 100 times stronger than steel in tension, the strongest fiber that you could ever make out of anything, ever. That would mean like a million years from now when you ask me what's the strongest thing, same thing. You know, something has to be the strongest of all possible objects, this is it. And you just, it's just carbon, so you could take coal or sewage or old rubber tires and convert them into bucky tubes. Think what we could do with that. So we could rewire the world we can make electrical cables that conduct electricity better than copper at one-sixth the weight. So when you think about this, do you, does it seem too good to be true? Does it seem magical or it something? It does. It does. I mean, how was the chance that you, that you can discover something like this? But that's one of the fascinating things about the current status of our understanding of chemistry and physics. In fact, we can calculate the behavior of things very well these days. The big mystery with bucky balls in these tubes is not that they would be great if you could make them. It was finding out you could actually make them. Carbon nanotubes are one of the reasons the word nanotechnology has become so well known. 
Some are describing it as a modern day industrial revolution. Nanotechnology refers to building things from scratch, like this nanomotor. It's the ability to assemble the atomic and molecular building blocks of nature to create a new generation of products and applications that are stronger and more precise. Is this the next realm of chemistry? Is this the next thing in chemistry? I'm glad to see you use the word chemistry about this because that's really what this is. We can't afford to uh, pick every atom up with our fingers and stick them in. We have to have the atoms self-assemble and they have to come from some source of cheap atoms so we can make these efficiently. We have a name for that. We call it chemistry. Of course, these days we call it nanotechnology. It's the same thing. We're after to make a structure of a particular exact form to do it hundreds of trillions of times a second, low cost with no environmental impact, uh, to give us an object that will allow us to do something technologically that we couldn't otherwise do. Making objects with, if we're really good, the ultimate level of finesse, the way nature has always built the molecules of living cells. We'll now do this everywhere. So it keeps you coming to work. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain romance about it. It's taken only two centuries to go from a time when atoms were a mere hypothesis to the brink of being able to snap atoms and molecules together and build new technology with fantastic possibilities. And the great discoveries that we've just seen helped make it happen. Exploring beneath the surface of things, inside the realm of chemistry, and changing the world.